Well, that music means it's Sunday afternoon and time for the Money Show. And this is Harry Brown, and what a pleasure to be back with you on this Sunday afternoon, March 13th, 2005. And we have, for this, the rest of this hour, we're going to talk about money, investments, economics, finances, anything having to do with money. And a few weeks ago, we were progressing uh, week after week with a discussion of what economics is and particularly what economics can do to help you choose investments or to speculate and uh, use it practically in your life. And we were interrupted last week because we had a nice guest on the show. But before last week, we had gotten to the point where we had talked about economics being the study of how limited resources are allocated to satisfy as many as possible of unlimited desires. Resources are limited. You have only so much time, you have only so much money, you have only so much energy, and there's only so many resources in the world, whether you're talking about coal or oil or wood or whatever it may be. And even if those resources were unlimited, our resources as human beings are limited in our ability to use those resources, to find them, discover them, and process them, and so forth. So we're always working with limited resources, but the human mind has no limit on its desires. Satisfy one desire, and two or three more sprout up. So we then got to the point where we pointed to, had defined economics as the study of how to use limited resources to satisfy as many as possible of our unlimited desires and to make sure that we're satisfying the most important of those desires rather than wasting the limited resources on lower desires and thereby having to forego the higher desires. And as I say, two weeks ago we got to the point where we recognized that the study of economics is not really a science so much as it is an art. And Henry Hazlitt said 40 years ago in his great book, Economics in One Lesson, the art of economics consists in looking not merely at the immediate, but at the longer effects of any act or policy. It consists in tracing the consequences of that policy, not merely for one group, but for all groups. And, of course, he was talking about the use of economics in setting national policy, but it has its analogy in personal economics, too. We need to keep our eyes on what our goals are. We need to keep our eyes on the consequences of our acts, whether they seem to be economic consequences or any kind of consequences. But the important point that Hazlitt made is that economics is an art, that we can't reduce this to dollars and cents, to figures, to a spreadsheet, to anything else, because the data is so vast and the data is constantly changing, uh, the data upon which we would make decisions. Now, we can look at the past, but what we're seeing in the past is just a snapshot of history. People are constantly changing. Uh, every day we are different from the day we, what we were the day before because we know something now that we didn't know yesterday. And that has an effect upon our decisions. We, as we change, we may change for the worse or we may change for the better. But the important thing is we change and people are changing. And so that if we had somehow a, the giant computer as big as New York City and the ability to collect all the data about what people thought and what their intentions were at this very moment, well, tomorrow morning that data would be obsolete because people would have changed in the meantime. Another important facet of economics is that it deals not with quantitative matters but with qualitative matters. Someone's preference of beef over pork, for instance, is a qualitative comparison. A quantitative comparison would be a number that somehow showed the extent to which a person prefers beef over pork. 
But of course, there is no such number. There is no such way of defining numerically how much an individual prefers beef over pork. A qualitative economic principle is that, for example, if it becomes more profitable to produce a commodity, the supply of it tends to increase. But economic theory cannot determine the quantity by which a given price increase would cause the supply to increase. All we know is that if the price of something goes up, more of it will be produced. But we can't say if the price goes up 5%, that production will go up 5%. It may go up 20% or 1%, and there's no way that economic theory can determine the percentage increase in production that an increase in price will produce. Any estimate that anybody makes is simply a guess, educated though it may be. So economics always comes back to the values that are held by human beings. And since value is subjective, in the eye of each individual, it can't be measured, uh, it can't be quantified, and it can't be used for any kind of mathematical analysis. How do you measure the demand for a commodity? Uh, the demand for money, or the intensity of a desire for something. How do you know at what level of, uh, say, international tension, how many individuals will dump how much of their stock portfolios and buy gold instead? And how do you even measure tension, which is a very important factor in determining what individuals are going to do? Economics can deal with comparisons, but not intensities. We can't add an individual's wants to those of other people and somehow arrive at a number that represents how intensely people in general want this or that and how they would respond to changes in price or other alternatives that might become available tomorrow morning. Uh, if mortgage rates fall below 10%, then we expect homeowners to uh, refinance their mortgages, as they have been doing over the last few years. But how many homeowners are going to refinance if interest rates drop another 1% over the next year? We assume that the number will be larger than it was at higher rates, but there's no way to measure in advance how big the increase is going to be. If the price of silver rises, more and more industrial consumers will look for substitutes reducing the demand for silver. But no formula can tell us at what price the supply will outrun demand or at what price investors will think it's high enough to warrant selling or at what price other investors will buy because they think the increasing price is creating a bandwagon that they better get on. Economic theory can only compare one situation with another. It can't measure the difference and give it a number that we can use to determine the value in an investment at this point in terms of what kind of price increase is available for it. Uh, we can't determine how these things are going to affect the intensity of increases in inflation or anything else. Well, we're just getting started, but we invite you to join this with comments or with questions about this or any other subject having to do with money. Just call 1-800-259-9231. That's 1-800-259-9231. Or you can email me, question at harrybrown.org. Question at harrybrown.org, and we will be back after these important announcements. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at libertyfree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. 
If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Failsafe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and this is The Money Show, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. And you can contact the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds at 1-800-531-5142 or at their website, permanentportfoliofunds.com. And uh, the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds is uh, a mutual has four portfolios, but one of them, the flagship, is the permanent portfolio, which uh, attempts to provide a balanced and diversified portfolio, just like we have discussed on this show, and in the process seeks safety and stability for your funds. Now, we can sum up what we've talked about in in, in the series on economics and then go on to how economics can be used usefully. Uh, But first we need to sum up what we have covered before, and the sum and substance of that is that if you try to use economics to predict the future, then you're going to have four strikes against you. The first one is that our ideas of the economic world are imperfect, because we can't confirm them through any kind of controlled tests. We can't herd people into a laboratory and check their reactions and expect that next week the same group of people will react in the same way or that other people will react in the same way because people are not like electrons or molecules or other things that always act in the same way, and one is the same as the other throughout the world, and so on. So we are always working with imperfect knowledge because it's been developed mentally rather than through controlled tests. Second, the application of economic theory isn't simple or unambiguous. Again, because we can't control the people, so it requires creativity and imagination And a very important part of the use of economics is the study of human nature, of just developing general ideas about how people tend to react. Those will be, again, imperfect ideas, but some people will be better than others. It is an art, and the most successful speculator is somebody who has that art as a natural talent, not as a skill that he learned in a classroom or got from a book. And if he were to write about how he makes decisions in speculating, it isn't going to mean that you can read that book and be like him any more than Luciano Pavarotti writing a book about singing is going to turn you into a world-class opera singer. All right, third, even if we could be sure that economic theory were being applied correctly, we still couldn't obtain sufficient data about human values or human intentions to predict the direction of the economy or investments. And lastly, even if we had that data, we couldn't reduce an expected result to numbers telling us precisely how high or how low an, an investment price or an interest rate or an economic indicator or an inflation rate or, or anything else is going to go. Economic principles are observations about human action, such as that the consumption of an item tends to increase when its price goes down. Economic principles are not formulas, that can tell you how much consumption will increase if the price goes down. Economics may explain reasonably that A generally leads to B, but it has no formula to tell you how soon A will lead to B, 
and in what quantity. And we've seen this of so many people predicting for 20 years that all the elements are there for an economic collapse in America, and no economic collapse has happened. It doesn't mean that it never will, and it doesn't mean even that the person's observations were wrong and that the things that he noticed weren't important. But we simply have no way of predicting the time or the intensity or any of these things. Investors and advisors who notice general principles and tendencies in the investment worlds unfortunately want to reduce these things into fixed, reliable formulas. For example, many investors have observed that an investment tends to draw the most publicity near the end of a bull market. In other words, when the publicity about a particular investment just gets to be pervasive, that it's being written about in Newsweek and Time and so forth, then you must be near the end of a bull market because probably all the people who were going to buy this have already bought, and that's why the price is so high and so on. So some investors or advisors then take the next scientific step and try to develop procedures for measuring the extent of an investment's publicity. Um, they gather numbers that should indicate when a bull market has ended. They try to count the number of uh, public um, mentions of this in the press and on television and so on, and uh, or they try to uh, poll the advisors and determine how many of them are bullish, and if too many of them are bullish, then the bull market must be just about over. But the problem is there's no way in economics to translate a general observation into an explicit formula. Observations about the way markets work are valuable. They can help you to be alert. They can keep you from rushing into an investment on the heels of a crowd. And they can keep you from getting carried away. But they can't tell you when a bull market will end any more than a fortune cookie can. Now, I realize that in spite of what I'm saying, that there are all kinds of economists and investment advisors who seem to be able to apply economics scientifically, who seem to have developed formulas to measure the past, present, and the future with precision, and who speak with the confidence that only success can bring. The way they talk, they must be successful. But what you might not know is that some of these people have made some of the most unsuccessful forecasts imaginable. If they speak with authority, it's because they've been, not because they've been right in the past, but only because humility isn't part of their repertoires. No matter how many times they fail, their self-assurance never weakens. Their greatest and perhaps their only talent is for speaking authoritatively. One famous advisor uh, in the early 1980s forecast again and again and again that inflation was coming back and silver was going to take off in the 80s, and none of these forecasts ever came true. And yet I remember reading a dissertation that he wrote in 1984 that I have here in front of me, and it began with a statement, the reason most commentators are confused about the economy, where it is and where it is likely to be in the next quarter or next year or the year after that is... And he went on to explain this. And, of course, you had to think, well, he must know what's going on or he wouldn't have talked like this. But no failure was going to make him doubt his profound understanding of economics and his superior insight into what's going on in the world. Well, give me a call at 1-800-259-9231 if you have a question. And we'll be back right after this break. This is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. Have you lost money in stocks over the past few years? From 2000 through 2002, the stock market lost a third of its value. But during those three years, a bulletproof portfolio gained 9%. And over the past 34 years, such a portfolio gained an average of over 9% per year throughout periods of prosperity, inflation, and recession with no wide swings in value. My book, Failsafe Investing, shows how you can have that kind of portfolio for yourself. And now you can download the book for only $9.75. You don't have to rely on alleged market wizards or stay up late worrying about your savings. Failsafe Investing will show you how to have the security that you crave. 
Go to LibertyFree.com to see a sample chapter of Fail Safe Investing and then start protecting the savings you've worked so hard to acquire. That's LibertyFree.com. Well, welcome back. Harry Brown here, and uh, the phone number again, 1-800-259-9231. Or you can email me, question at harrybrown.org. And since we don't have any phone calls yet, you can get right in. But in the meantime, let me continue and wrap up our discussion of economics. And the good news is that even though economics has its limitations, and they may seem to be very, very strong limitations that make them worthless, uh, makes economics worthless to us in our investments and so forth, the fact is that economics is still a very valuable study, and it's a fascinating study. Economic theory can uh, help you to understand the world, to be prepared and aware of the possibility of things that might turn out to be great surprises to other people. Economics can help you understand why the consequences of government programs are seldom what was said for them, that the promises of politicians having to do with anything uh, economic, those promises never, ever seem to come true. Economic theory can help you reject unrealistic investment plans. Uh, Economic theory can help you to spot cliches that make no sense whatsoever. Economic theory can help you develop the strategy and portfolio uh, that might have the best chance of protecting you in the unknowable future. Now, all of those benefits that I just uh, came up with seem to be negative, except the last one, where I said that it can help you develop the strategy and the portfolio that has the best chance of protecting you in an uncertain world. And that in itself is very, very important and very positive. But I don't want to denigrate the negative benefits of economic theory. Because if you're capable of seeing through the things that turn the heads of other people, Uh, That's a great, great advantage in the investment world. It will keep you from losing money. And the first rule of investments must be to not lose money, to not make mistakes wherever possible. It doesn't mean you won't ever lose any money or ever make a mistake, but that should be your guiding principle. You've worked very, very, very hard to earn the money with which you're going to make the investments or speculations. And you can't easily replace that money. The time that it took to earn that money is gone. That time is gone. You're never going to be that age again. You're never going to be in that position again. And you're going to have to work twice as hard in the future to continue earning the money you normally earn, plus enough to make up for what you lost in bad investments. And so those negative possibilities, pardon me, those negative benefits of understanding economics, I think are very, very important, right along with the positive benefits of helping you to develop a portfolio that will deal with an uncertain world. And we must also recognize that economics can't tell you what will happen, but it can prepare you for what might happen. That person who has been predicting an imminent collapse in the economy for 20 years was wrong in predicting an imminent collapse, but he was not wrong in recognizing the possibility of it. And if you recognize the possibility of it, you don't have to run out and put all your money in the one thing that would protect you in that situation or even profit from that situation, but by recognizing that possibility and other possibilities, you can build a portfolio that not only will protect you in all of these possibilities, but also will relieve your mind so that you don't have to worry all the time about those possibilities. (coughs) Excuse me. 
So we can wrap this up by saying economic principles really are especially useful in the investment world. It's a great help, for instance, to understand how increases in the money su supply do increase the likelihood, not, not the certainty, but the likelihood of inflation, or why federal deficits caused interest rates to be higher than they would be otherwise, not necessarily absolutely higher, but higher than they would be in the absence of the federal deficits, or how price controls usually lead to shortages and eventually to higher prices. And finally, once again, I have to say that economics is an even bigger help in rejecting nonsense. With an understanding of economics, you often can judge immediately that an idea you hear is inconsistent with what you know about the world and about the way human beings act in general, or that the idea is just logically flawed. You'll know that OPEC members can't raise oil prices just by wanting to, or that a population of one billion doesn't make China automatically an economic power, uh, that these things, when they're floated around, don't add up logically. But just don't expect economics to unlock the secrets of the future for you. The value of economics is in its ability to reveal hidden consequences to keep you open to possibilities that other people ignore, and to help you prepare for potential futures that arrogant people refuse even to consider. Humility is a prime, prime value. It's a virtue in economics. That humility expressed in many ways, that you can't know everything, that you can't know what other people in the world are going to do, and that even if you have a good idea what they're going to do, there may be other factors that will counteract what people are going to do, and that those factors may cancel out the plan that you had for the future. And that humility, then, will make sure that you are prepared for the possibility that the investment that you think must go up might not go up, and that if it doesn't go up, it's not going to throw you for a loop, it's not going to take away money that is precious to you. It is not going to ruin your life or make you start over again. Humility, as I say, is a prime virtue in economics. Now, humility will be treated as cowardice by the arrogant people in economics, and pardon me, in investments, the people who are claimed to always be right. But the fact of the matter is that those people have a talent for losing money, and the humble people have a step up on everybody else. We do live in an uncertain world, and that's one of the first things we have to learn in economics, and that there is no way to overcome uncertainty, but in fact there are ways of dealing with it. We do that in other areas of our life. We recognize the uncertainty, and we deal with it, deal with it very naturally. We'll talk about how you deal with uncertainty when we come back from this break. This is Harry Brown, phone number 1-800-259-9231. We'll be back. Well, welcome back. This is Harry Brown, and this is The Money Show, and we are now going to go to the phones and talk with Bob in Alabama. Good afternoon, Bob. Good afternoon, Harry. What's on your mind today? Well, I, I was listening to what you were saying about economics, and uh, uh, and I subscribe to the, the whole portfolio, uh, the balanced portfolio concept, or permanent portfolio, I should say. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the thing, the problem that I have is... Like most people, I just I hate to buy high, you know. I like to buy low, and I like and I like to sell high. Sure. Uh, now, you know, I know that you you know subscribe to, or I've heard you say several times, well, just go ahead and just do it, you know. Uh, go ahead and 
and get your portfolio balanced, get it in 25% gold, cash, bonds, and um, socks. But, I, but psychologically, I, it's very difficult sometimes. It is. I, I, you know, and I've done it. But, you know, what, I've, what I have done is I've, I've, I've modified the plan, if you will, a little bit on how I go about actually buying the, uh, the items. I'll, I'll uh, compare the, uh, you know, the, the history. I mean, I have to look at history to try to predict the future, and I know it's difficult to predict the future, but, you know, like right now stocks are high, bonds are high, uh, the, the, uh, gold's still a little high. So what I do is I just stick it in cash, you know, and I'll just leave it in cash until one of those uh, particular uh, markets drops, uh, you know, down below its historic uh, uh, mean, or, you know, uh, according to like a uh, moving day average, a uh, 200-day moving average, and then I'll acquire at that time. I mean, do you have any comment on trying to play it like that? Well, all I can say is that there is no investment price so high that it can't go higher and there is no investment price so low that it can't go lower and i got I've told these stories so many times about people uh in the 1980s who just said uh first of all i said they wouldn't buy the bonds because the bonds had done terribly during the 70s and everybody knew that they were just a terrible investment and of course they hit bottom and started to go up and then uh, I would get letters to my newsletter, which I had at the time, from uh, much the same people saying, well, I can see now that I was wrong about bonds. I should have bought the bonds, but I can't buy them now because they've already gone up so far that they're not going to go any higher. Right. And then a year or so later, I'd get another letter from the more, in fact, several letters from much the same people saying, well, I should have bought them last year. I realized that they were not as high as they could go, but now I couldn't possibly buy them now. But the point is that we never never know. We have no way of knowing whether something's going to go higher or lower next year, and the fact of what it has done so far is meaningless. I mean, when the Dow Jones was at 6,000, there were so many people saying, how much higher could it go? And of course, now it's over 10,000. And bonds, uh, you know, the interest rate's down to around, uh, what is it, uh, four and three quarter percent or so on the on the long bond, how much lower could could it, could it go? Well, I can tell you, in the 1930s, it went down to 1%. And so there's a lot of room for it to go further. And what would happen if the bottom fell out tomorrow? Um, interest rates would just collapse uh, because nobody would... Um, would want to borrow, people would only want to, to hold on to cash and, and uh, uh, people would be trying to uh, uh, lend money under those circumstances. And uh, anyway, the point is that uh, you would be unprotected if uh, interest rates dropped like that suddenly, if, the, if they just hit an air pocket and went down. Uh, I keep coming back to the point that the permanent portfolio concept, which for anybody who hasn't heard it before, is the concept of having diversified investments that balance each other out and that are powerful enough so that each one of them is capable of carrying the portfolio upward in some economic environment, so powerful it will overcome the losses in the other. But this concept is a package. And if you don't have all the elements, then you don't have the package, then what you are doing is speculating. And speculation is, by definition, trying to beat the return that's available to everybody else, trying to outguess the market. And that's all right. But for the money that's precious to you, outguessing the market is very, very dangerous because that money can't be replaced in many cases. It's just so hard, Harry, uh, right. sometimes to just go ahead and, and dive in and say, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this even though it's, it's higher I'm, or I'm going to sell this. Sure. Uh, at that point. I, mean, I, un I understand that, and I have not had the, the benefit of talking to everyone uh, who does this three months after they've done it or six months after they've done it. But the people that I have had the opportunity to talk with, uh, maybe even a year or two or three afterward, have told me that as difficult as it was to make the decision to start, that within two or three months afterward, regardless of what happened in the markets, they suddenly realize, oh, God, I'm so glad I just went ahead and did this because now 
I don't even think about this stuff anymore because I know I'm protected whatever happens. And so it's a hard curtain to walk through, but on the other side of it, you're going to feel a lot better very, very quickly after you do so. Right. Um, you got to, you got to, yeah. <laughs> as the doctor would say, you got to take the sharp pain, the, in order, the acute pain in order to get rid of the chronic pain. Gotcha. Thanks, uh, Jerry. Okay. Thank you for calling, Bob. All right. Well, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes, and uh, we have more to say. So uh, please don't go away. My goodness, don't go away. This is Harry Brown. This is Harry Brown. My book, Fail Safe Investing, will tell you what you need to know to create your own bulletproof investment portfolio, one that will protect you whatever the future brings, prosperity, inflation, recession, even depression, and it will protect you without your having to predict the future or tinker with the portfolio. Best news of all, at LibertyFree.com, you can download the book for only $9.75. That's right, just nine seventy five. You can read the book on your computer screen or print it out and read it in your easy chair. If you're tired of losing money on your investments, tired of the pressure of looking for the best investments, here's the way to have your own bulletproof portfolio, no matter how big or small your savings. To get a free sample chapter from Fail Safe Investing, just go to libertyfree.com right now. That's libertyfree.com. Well, I want to thank you very much for listening uh, today and hope that you'll be back with us next week and also want to remind you that we also have a political show on Saturday nights at 10 o'clock for two hours, uh, 10 o'clock Eastern that is, 7 o'clock Pacific for two hours on the same network. And before we go away, we've got a question from Kelly in Portland, Oregon, who says, I've heard a lot about the Chinese yuan being undervalued versus our dollar. Do I have any knowledge or input on the subject? No, I don't. Um, the dollar, of course, has been dropping uh, pretty dramatically over the last year, and a lot of people feel that it is just going to keep on going down and down and down because of our trade deficits and budget deficits and so on. But, of course, we've got to look at this logically. We've had budget deficits before. We've had trade deficits for the last 30 years. If I say we've had budget deficits before, we've had budget deficits since the last uh, surplus was recorded, actual real surplus, not the phony surpluses that they had in the 90s. The last real surplus was in the late 1960s. So, anyway, the point is that the dollar can go lower, but it also may rebound and suddenly go into a bull market. And I have not paid a lot of attention to China and the Chinese economy, Kelly. I'm sorry. So I'm just not a very good um, resource to give you even uh, an educated opinion on it or even an educated guess. But with regard to the dollar in general, I would not write it off as being passe that the euro is going to take over and so on. When the euro first came out, I was very dubious about the euro, and immediately the euro started to drop from the one-to-one -one par that it had been set up with the dollar. And then suddenly the euro turned around and went up, and I don't know where it is now, but it's somewhere like a dollar twenty-five or a dollar thirty. It has been very strong against the dollar. So the point is, it can go in one direction and then suddenly go in the other direction. Gee, what a revealing insight that investments not only go down, they go up. They not only go up, they go down. But <laughs> have to keep coming back to the fact that we live in an uncertain world. And I never did get to the point about what it is, uh, how it is we deal with uncertainty. We deal with uncertainty by being prepared, sometimes just being prepared mentally, but other times being actually prepared, prepared in practice. And this is the way we live our whole lives. 
we don't go to fortune tellers to try to find out if uh, our, my daughter should marry this guy that she's uh, interested in now. We don't uh, try to predict the future when we get a job. We just look at the prospects for the future, but we don't believe the future is written in stone. And we're prepared to deal with surprises as they come along. In investments, it's I think for the money that's precious to you, it's more than just being prepared mentally. You have to actually have a balanced portfolio. And we'll be discussing that as we go along. Well, this has been The Money Show, uh, brought to you in part by the Permanent Portfolio Family of Funds. And I sure hope you come back next week. This is Harry Brown. Thanks for listening. (laughs) 